going to be talking now about uh, some of the implications of Brexit on the uh, commercial property industry in particular. Well, it's been an interesting time so far this year anyway, and we have one or two more challenges, I think. If you take a look at the um, various surveys that have been around in the past quarter, um, and if, in particular if you have a look at the construction index um, on the slide, uh, the, the downturn is 2009. Um, things have been slowing down this quarter anyway. Um, that was before Brexit, so we just have to factor that in to the, the fun and games that's going to be happening over the next few months. Um, it was challenging, it's now volatile. If you have a look at the um, prices that shares have um, been hit uh, recently, uh, Foxton's slumped by 22% today. Uh, they are uh, obviously a very high quality London based uh, agent. If you also have a look at land securities, they dropped 185 pence on the day of the Brexit result. Um, pretty much every other residential developer also got hit in this way. Um, a lot of commercial contracts that were negotiated pre-Brexit actually had uh, Brexit clauses in them and I do know of one whereby the buyer was entitled purely on the result of the referendum, nothing about um, any results that happened afterwards, they were entitled to reduce the purchase price by 10%. Mm. Uh, other contracts I know uh, they do actually have provisions whereby the, the buyers are able to walk away. Now this could have an implication when it comes to the actual um, ability to do construction work. As, as David mentioned previously, um, there are potential employment issues about uh, what's going to happen next. And if you think that about 12% of all construction workers come from abroad, well, how's that going to work? Markets hate uncertainty and property is, is a classic example of this. There have been several uh, examples now of um, big investment funds saying you can't take your money out. So on the 4th of July, Standard Life, which is the largest investment fund, it deals with a mix of office, retail, warehousing, uh, general commercial property. Um, they suspended trading. Um, it's been followed by M&G and Aviva and various other funds. So a, a lot of jitter. Now the problem with jitter is that that can depress prices. The problem with that then is anybody who has a mortgage is going to start feeling their, their collar when it comes to banking covenants. What you have to bear in mind when you have a mortgage is that you will have various obligations to the bank and one of them will be to make sure that you do not have too much risk for the bank. That will be based on property values and also on the rental income that that bank will be able to see coming in to fund the mortgage. Now if you go back to 2007, the average length of a commercial lease was 7.2 years. Now that dipped big time come 2008, 9, 10 and onwards and it was just starting to recover so that it was only back in 2015 that the average lease length was the same. Now this is crucially important to a landlord. Obviously the longer the lease length, the longer they have the guaranteed income. So any sensible landlord is going to work really hard to retain the tenants that they have on the longer leases because of the issues that they may have with the bank. If they're in breach of the banking covenants, technically the bank can call in the loan which um, is a, a serious issue. Now, from a tenant's point of view, you are potentially in a stronger position. 
because of the amount of uncertainty, a lot of people will be trying to think on their feet, what, what costs do they know they have to commit to? In an uncertain market, tenants quite often benefit because they can negotiate shorter leases or longer rent freeze or, or break clauses. Now, if you're already in a lease, the first thing to have a look at is, can you break your lease? Because if you can and you need to get out or you are thinking of renegotiating with your landlord, you have a much stronger position. So can you break your lease? I'm going to run through the, the main trigger points for a break clause. Uh, I'm going to be talking about notice periods, service addresses, paying the rent, vacant possession and complying with your covenants. Now, what you have to remember as a tenant is that the clock is always ticking. Landlords do not like break clauses. They will do everything in their power to make it difficult for you to exercise your break clause. And one of the things that is absolutely crucial to this is time is of the essence. And what that means is that, for example, on the service of a notice, if the notice period is six months, you cannot give five months, 28 days. It has to be following the terms of the lease to the letter. Because if you don't, the landlord will turn up and say, keep paying the rent. Notice periods are one thing. Linked very closely with that are the service provisions. Now, the lease might say, serve at the registered office of the landlord at least six months before the break date. Well, that's fine if you know that the registered office of the landlord is in the UK. Um, I've had to serve two break notices in the past four months, um, one in Cyprus, one in Luxembourg. Well, obviously you need a lot longer time to be absolutely sure that you can actually get to the right place and the, the notice is accepted, it's not like just popping around the corner and, and pushing it through the envelope, uh, pushing the envelope through the, the door. So please, please take legal advice in good time on where you actually have to serve the break notice. Another minefield is the obligation to pay the rent. Now, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? You've got to pay the rent up until the break date. Well, let's say that you want, uh, that the lease says you can end your lease on the 8th of July, having paid all the rent up to that date. Sounds great. The issue is that most leases have quarterly payments on the quarter days. So for example, the rent that um, covers the period up until the 8th of July will be due and payable on the 24th of June. But the problem is that when you say the rent payable up until the break date, well, the rent payable will be that quarter's rent. So the whole time up until the 28th of September. If you just pay from 24th of June to the 8th of July and then try and terminate your lease, you may well find that you have breached the terms of the break clause. It's complicated stuff, but please, bear in mind that the courts say, well, if you, if you meant that, you'd have said that. The other delightful point is you may think, OK, I'm going to pay my rent from the 24th of June up until the September quarter day, and I'm going to break the lease on the 8th of July. If the lease doesn't say, and the landlord will repay the money from the 9th of July onwards, he keeps it. Vacant possession is another really thorny one. Um, there is increasing tendency for this clause to be watered down, but a lot of the leases that are in at the moment will say that you have to give vacant possession. Picture this scenario. A tenant has a look at his break clause. He has to give six months notice which he does to the registered office, which he does. He pays all the rent in the appropriate fashion and is so organised he 
gets a skip in his car park because the, the lease is of a building and a car park area. All the rubbish into the skip, fantastic. Vacant possession, what does that mean? You've got to clear the place of everything that you have and you've got to get rid of any tenants. Super, what can go wrong? Well, in one particular case I know of, what went wrong was the weather. Um, just before the break date, it started snowing. And when it came the time for the skip delivery company to actually come and pick up the skip, they said, no, it's too dangerous, sorry, can't do it. So on the day that the lease was meant to end, there was this stonking great big skip in the car park. And the landlord said, well, you haven't complied with your obligations under the break clause. And, and that took a lot of sorting out. The other nightmare that still happens is the obligation to comply with the lease terms. Now, for a, a man on the street, that should be fine. I'm a good tenant, of course I'm going to comply with my lease terms. But what the landlord is looking for is the ability to say, you have done everything you needed to do with regard to the repair of the place, the decoration, making sure that you've provided all the appropriate statutory certificates. And that's not so easy. Uh, there was a lease once where the brake clause failed because they used two coats of paint instead of three. The whole point of compliance with lease terms is you probably have to throw an awful lot more money at it than you would normally have to do. Um, I had an example um, a few years back where we were trying to um, advise a, a tenant in a similar situation they ended up spending thousands and thousands of pounds more than they probably needed to because they'd done everything they thought they should do and that involved taking out all manner of um, structural alterations, partitioning, redecorating, completely changing it back to the way it was at the start of the lease and were getting no help whatsoever from the landlord. They were saying, look, we think this is really great now and the landlord was saying, maybe. I'll have a look after the lease date, which was a, quite a canny game from the landlord because it just left the possibility of the tenant having missed something. The counter to that inevitably was the tenant having to throw money at it because throwing money at it was actually more cost effective than being stuck for um, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of pounds of rent over the next few years. So that's what happens if you might be able to get out of your lease. For those organisations who are stuck where they are, and for landlords generally, uh, I'm just going to run through a couple of um, statutory obligations, just, just to give you a feel for the kind of things that are costs of owning commercial property or being responsible for commercial property, whether bre Brexit has um, implications or not. So the first one, is um, the changes that are coming in on energy performance certificates. Now, these are very much European-based legislation. It's, it's, it's all about um, carbon reduction and the attempt to make everything carbon neutral um, by 2050. So all this has come from Europe. The government has implemented it, and it's here. Um, there are changes that will be coming in. Uh, the, the first important one will take effect uh, from the 1st of April 2018. Possibly the government will um, hold this off, um, but who, who can say? The next change comes in 2023, which has a much greater cost implication. Now, it all goes down to the energy performance of buildings. So if, if you look at the, the graph, I mean, the, the, the vast majority are within the middle bands. The problem comes with the bad guys sitting at the far end, bands F and G. These are the inefficient, um, either poorly heated or poorly insulated buildings. And these are the ones that this particular band of legislation is going to be dealing with. So what's going to happen? 
from 2018, you will not be allowed to rent, uh, to let out one of these buildings. So without actually pushing it up to at least band E. So what are you going to do with these band F and G properties? You've got time to sell. Who knows whether the market will hold up? That might be um, no longer a commercially viable option if you don't get your skates on. Again, crystal ball time, I'm afraid. Um, you could refurbish it. Um, drag it up so that um, it's now at least an E. Um, if you don't, then you're going to have problems um, either getting tenants, because you won't be able to, um, or you will have um, tenants increasingly saying, well, this has an adverse effect on my uh, rent, and therefore you can't actually get a rent increase at rent review in the way that you would otherwise. Um, big big, big longer-term issues. Um, the thing to bear in mind is that it's, um, the, res the restrictions start in 2018, and by 2023, there are much heavier implications, cost penalties, requirements that organisations will have to comply with. And I think on this one, it's a case of watch this space. Another piece of legislation that affects commercial property hasn't come from Europe. It's been around um, for the past 100 years or so, um, no doubt backed up by the um, European health and safety concept, but it has been a formal part of, of English law for some time, increasingly tightened up as knowledge increases, and that's all to do with asbestos. Fantastic stuff, so, so many varieties. Fire retardant, great to use. If you have a look at the chart, you can see back in, from 1950s for the next 25 years or so, it was a boon to the construction industry. And therein lies the trouble. Because, of course, the fibres in asbestos, if they lodge in somebody's lungs, maybe 30 years down the line, some extremely nasty diseases um, can be contracted. Uh, and if you just have a look at the mesothelioma rates, again, they started peaking in 2010, and that's because of the length of gestation. Up to 60 years it can take for these um, fibres to take effect, 30 is quite common. So legislation has been in for a while. The control of asbestos regulations started in 2004. Uh, the use of asbestos was banned prior to that, but from 2004 and subsequently updated in the 2012 regulations, um, there was a duty to manage any possible asbestos within commercial property. Now, the importance of that is even though asbestos has been banned for quite some time now, there are still about 500,000 workplace premises that could contain asbestos. And the, the regulations assume that any building that was put up before the year 2000 might have some. So the duty to manage all relates to making an assessment with the premise that if you're not sure whether it's got asbestos or not, you have to treat it as containing asbestos until you have other information. And this is primarily, for example, to protect a guy who comes in to do some electrical work, drills through a wall, fibres get released, he breathes in the fibres. But it works f and it applies to workers, employees, people that just come in as, as visitors. The obligation is on the people who are responsible for the repair and maintenance of commercial premises. This is unlikely to change. Why should it? Um, it's, it's there because there was a very serious, obvious health risk involved in these materials. So I think we've sort of had a laugh a minute here um, 
over the past few. Um, and I just wanted to end it on a So this, this really has been a laugh a minute, and I do apologise for that. Um, I thought I'd end on a high, nice piece of uh, cheerful news. Uh, just, just going back to um, focusing on the uncertainties that the commercial property market will be facing over the next few months, years, who knows. Um, the Bank of England's financial stability report came out um, and they, in their beautiful way, said that there was a risk of future marked adjustment in real estate prices. Well, that's, that's, that's a lovely way of, of um, just saying that we're in for a bumpy ride. I'm very happy to take questions later. Thank you very much for your time, and um, I will hand you over. Thank you very much.